All right, we now need to calculate something called the crack propagation rate in order to predict the high cycle fatigue. When these things are going to cycle for, you know, a thousand, ten thousand, a million, ten million, many, many cycles, we'd like to be able to predict how long they're going to last. And in order to do that, we need to know how fast this crack is growing, right? Now, experiments have shown the following. Crack growth rate increases with length. So the bigger a crack is, the faster it grows and it increases with stress. So for example, these types of curves are very typical, where the crack length is plotted against the number of cycles. We see the following. First off, at a given stress, let's say that this right here is stress one, this is stress two, and this one would be at stress three. Um, different stresses cause it to grow at faster rates. So if they all started at the same point, but this thing grew to, what's that crack length? 0.8 after only 200,000 cycles. This one took longer, and this one took longer. Therefore, we know that stress 1 must be greater than stress 2, which is must be greater than stress 3, right? The other thing we notice is that when it's here, its slope is like that, right? When it's down here, its slope is like that. So dA dn, right, the slope of this line, dA dn is not a constant, right? We just said that the rate increases the bigger it is, right? Therefore, we need an expression for how the crack growth rate is changing over time. We use this expression. DADN is equal to A times delta K raised to the N. A and K are, or A and N are materials constants. Delta K is the range in the stress intensity factor. Therefore, delta K is equal to the maximum stress intensity minus the minimum. Therefore, it's equal to Y times the maximum stress minus the minimum stress times the square root of pi times a, okay? Now, remember, for this class, we're doing a very simple introductory version of fatigue, so we are not going to consider any crack growth under compression. If compressive stress, then we assume that there is no stress intensity factor. In the real world, cracks can grow under tension or compression, but in this scenario, we're only going to worry about tension, okay? So, you've got crack growth, and then you end up with three stages of crack growth, okay? Fatigue crack propagation rate. Now, you'll notice that we're plotting this on a log scale. What is a log scale? A log scale means that you start counting by tens, right? Uh, by factors of ten. So you go from one, and then it becomes ten, and then it becomes one hundred, and then it becomes one thousand, and so forth. So down here, you've got ten to the minus eighth, ten to the minus seventh, ten to the minus sixth, fifth, and so forth, right? And that's plotted against the logarithm of the stress intensity. Well, it's, again, it's a stress intensity factor, but also on a logarithmic scale. So it's also going by orders of magnitude. If you plot it in this way, you will end up in region, you'll observe that there is a region 2, which is linear. What do we mean by that? Well, that linear region is just this expression. And you might say, well, that's not a linear equation. This is an exponential equation. The only way to make it linear is by plotting it on logarithmic axes or by converting your data uh, by taking the natural log. Let's go ahead and do that. Remember, we started with the following. We started with dA dn equals a constant A times delta K raised to a constant N. So let's go ahead and take natural log of both sides of this expression. We end up with natural log of dA dn equals natural log of A plus n times natural log of delta k. When you take the natural log of something raised to the exponent, it allows you to bring it down in front as a coefficient. And when you have two things multiplied together and you take the natural log of them, you can just add the two ones. That's why these things get separated into two terms when they start out as one term. Okay, So that is this expression for the linear region. Okay, um, And if you notice, this is actually just an expression for a line if our axes are in logarithmic terms. For example, if our axes are in logarithmic, which they are for the y-axis, then this is just y equals, again, our x-axis, the range in the stress intensity factor, that's this guy right here, that's going to be our x, right? So it's going to be a constant plus m times x. So the slope is going to be, the slope of this line will be n, and the y-intercept down here would be the a value, well, natural log of a, okay? So that is uh, this expression for crack growth. You'll want to make sure that you know how to read logarithmic axes, right? For example, why do these lines 
start out with a big jump and then they get smaller and smaller. Uh, that's how logarithmic uh, axes work, right? If this is 10 to the 1, that's 10. That makes this line right there 20, and then 30, all the way up to 100. So you're counting by factors of 10. And then this one, the next line over would be 200, not 110. Uh, that's how logarithmic axes work. I'll have a separate video uh, in the comment or in the in the description of this video if you need a reminder on how to read logarithmic axes. Okay, but uh, that is uh, that is crack growth for us. Okay, now what do we do with this? Once we know the values of a and n, let's say you read them from a plot like this, so you know how the crack grows over time, that becomes really great because we can use it to figure out the number of cycles till failure. Here's how it works. We start out with our expression right here, dA over dN equals A delta K to the N. The first thing we're going to do is separate the variables. You have two things that are changing, the crack length and the number of cycles. Let's separate those to two different sides of the equation. We end up with this expression here, dN equals dA over A delta K to the N, right? Now we can integrate both sides by their respective variable that's changing. On the left, we're going to integrate over all the cycles, from zero cycles all the way up to the number of cycles till failure, we're going to integrate the cycles, dn, okay? So that's really easy. It's just going to be the number of cycles till failure. That's an easy integral to take. And on the right-hand side, what's changing is the crack length. So we're going to integrate from its initial crack size, a naught. Our initial crack length is where it starts at. And we're going to integrate all the way up until the critical crack length. That's when it's going to fail. Now, how do we know what the critical crack length is? We use Griffith fracture equation, which we learned earlier. Remember this. We said that k1c is equal to y sigma multiplied by pi times a critical, right? In other words, we could rearrange this for cyclic stress since this cycle uh, is cycling back and forth. This is going to be the maximum stress right there, right? And we could solve for it. We would say that our critical crack length is equal to k1c over y sigma max. This whole thing is squared and then divided by pi that will give us our critical crack length. So this is pretty great. If you know A and N for different materials and there are different tables available, you should be able to substitute all this in and you should be able to solve for the number of cycles until failure, right? Just by plugging in these values, A, N, the range in stress, pi, um, the geometric constant, and then the initial crack size and the final crack length, and you should be able to take this integral and end up with the number of cycles till failure. How useful is that? Rather than waiting 10 million cycles, you can estimate what it ought to be if you figure out the rate of growth of the crack in your system from known constants.